This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I'm Michael Moffat, I'm the CEO of Cavendish Global, and uh, on behalf of our host, the uh, University of California at San Diego, and the entire uh, Cavendish community, welcome. Uh, we're thrilled to be here uh, for the Cavendish Global Health Impact Forum, which is a celebration of philanthropy and innovation that is changing the world. Uh, as you know, Cavendish uh, is a peer-to-peer -peer community of leading family offices, uh, sovereign wealth fund representatives, and family office foundations from around the world who share a passion for sustainable philanthropy, impact investing, and innovation that has a potential for transformational impact. Given our focus uh, and the passion of our members, uh, I can't think of a better place to be uh, holding this forum than beautiful San Diego and La Jolla. And thank you to all of our hosts uh, for this entire week. Uh, w during the course of the week, we have four important objectives. Uh, these objectives reflect the mission of Cavendish and uh, what we're trying to accomplish here this week and at others of our forums. The first is to champion and share, to provide a peer-to-peer -peer setting for family offices and their foundations to champion information on specific sustainable philanthropy and impact investing projects and to share those projects uh, with their peers. Uh, the second objective is to access knowledge and insight to help family offices and foundation, foundations share best practices with each other uh, to identify the best, scientifics, the best scientists, the most accomplished innovators and world-class experts driving transformational in innovation and to benefit from their advice and guidance. Uh, third is to create durable relationships. This is probably the most important part of uh, our most important objective in these forums, uh, to foster and establish family office collaborations amongst their peers and to sustain partnerships and innov with innovators which will endure post-forum and have a positive pro-social impact for years to come. And finally, to access opportunities, to connect family offices and foundations with compelling researchers, not-for-profit organizations, and private sector companies who are engaged in developing innovations with the potential for transformational impact. And now I'd ask my colleague, co-founder and president of Cavendish Global, uh, to give you some insights on how we accomplish this on behalf of the community. Cavendish is of, by, and for family offices and foundations and sovereign wealth funds from around the world. So everything we do to accomplish the goals that, that Michael just described is actually driven and shaped by, by our community. And we help our families accomplish the goals that Michael just described in several ways. Uh, one of the most important is what we're doing here today and with the University of California, San Diego, which is with our impact forums that are hosted by leading institutions, and we are certainly with a leading institution today. Um, in the future, uh, we'll be at the Cleveland Clinic in October of this year, and in 2016 and 17, we're evalu evaluating other um, host proposals from institutions, including Johns Hopkins and, and others. The, the second resource that our families avail themselves of is, is Cavendish Advisors, which helps families structure their giving and impact investing strategies and conduct due diligence utilizing our, our global network of relationships. We also, on behalf of and with our families and members, um, evaluate private sector companies and not-for-profit organizations that have the potential for transformational impact. And uh, Tony Kuhn, if you wouldn't mind standing, being recognized, Rick Hultz and uh, Gigi Goudet have over the last year evaluated um, over 1,000 private sector companies and over 200 not-for-profit organizations in that capacity. Um, and we have our family office council 
and the custodian of our family office relationships and the keeper of the flame of our family office relationships, and that's Catherine Underwood, uh, who joined us last year from the New York Academy of Sciences and has a lifelong uh, uh, experience in working with leading families from around the world. And then we have Cavendish Capital, led by Titus Weinheimer, which works with our families and, and foundations and sovereign wealth funds in the deployment of capital, both in the private sector and the not-for-profit sector. And finally, we have um, Cavendish IQ, which is our web-based uh, platform, which enables what is gonna happen here over the next four days to happen on a web platform. We have Chris Hultz, who's hiding away there at the back of the room, who is our chief digital officer at Cavendish, and he and our software developers are busy working away on that. Um, while you're here, uh, to be part of Cavendish IQ, it's by invitation. Um, so if you, everybody here, we're extending an invitation to you to become part of Cavendish IQ, a very powerful resource to access knowledge, learning, education, and intelligence on, on innovation being done by families and foundations from around the world. If you would like to be part of Cavendish IQ, you need to see Chris Holt sometime in the next four days, and we will extend uh, the opportunity for you to be part of Cavendish IQ when Chris and the team bring it live in the, by the fourth quarter of this year. <laughs> and you all are witnesses to that, <laughs> no pressure. Um, and then um, finally we have as a very important part of, of Cavendish IQ is education and learning. Uh, there are wonderful education and learning resources and intelligence resources made available by leading institutions that we're affiliated with around the world. And James Benedict, who is somewhere in the room, uh, there you go is, is our, our chief education officer for our, our work um, in the digital, digital uh, domain and encourage you to, to reach out to, um, uh, to James. So um, uh, that, that's what we do and, and how we do it. And uh, I wanted to share with you in conclusion before handing over to the chancellor. Um, one of my mentors you know, once said, Alex, one of the uh, keys to success in life is, is showing up and to show up at the right place and at the right time and with the right people. And, and we've certainly done that today, and as have all of you, uh, so everyone gets a gold star for that. Um, you have an opportunity as a function of having shown up and to show up to every session that we have over the course of today to make another impact. Cavendish has a scholarship program, and we have a, uh, a quiz for everybody to participate in. At the end of each session, you will be given a password. And if you have um, a mobile device, which I do here, and you downloaded the Cavendish app from either the Google or the Apple store, and you click on that and click on the schedule and click on a track, you will see at the bottom of that screen um, a section on there about a poll. Now, I apologize for my speech impediment, but that's P-O-L-L. -L. <laughs> and if you click on that, you will be given a multiple choice to select a password. And there's only one right password. But here's the good thing. You're all going to be given the answers. And every time you're in a session, you have the opportunity to select the right password, which will be given by one of the speakers during that session. So for example, if you were in our millennial women track later and you're in that session, you may be given uh, a multiple choice of the right password being General Motors, Chrysler, or Nissan. And the right answer might be Nissan. And if you select that, every single time everybody in this room uses the app and selects the right password, $50 will be added to the Cavendish Scholarship Program. There are over 400 people participating in this program over the next four days. We have over 100 speakers, so there's a significant opportunity for each of you to have a ha uh, an impact by participating in the programs and participating in the poll. So with that, I will turn over to our host and the Chancellor of the University of California, San Diego. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, and let me first say a thank you to Malcolm and Alex for uh, choosing San Diego to be the place to host this forum. Uh, and I can tell you there could not have been a better choice or a more appropriate choice. In fact, if I had my druthers, this wall would not exist. And if this wall did not exist, you would see the ocean on the other side. And in San Diego, just like people say smell the roses, we say smell the ocean because it is amazing to smell the seawater out here and really wake up in the morning. Uh, with that said, my job is to be the warm-up act 
for the real acts to follow, who are gonna give you a lot of substance about some of the great things we are doing out here. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of context of who we are at UC San Diego, what is it we do, and how did we get to where we are. So, we are a $4 billion campus, one of 10 campuses in the UC system, uh, 30,000 students, uh, 25,000 faculty and staff, 160,000 alumni. Uh, but more importantly, we are 54 years old. We are younger than me for sure, and many of the people around here. Uh, and in these 54 years, we have accomplished things that no university that was created since World War II has risen as fast and as high as we have. And this has been a function of many, many things. Number one, it was a function of our founders who were visionaries, who were Nobel laureates, members of National Academy. This is a function of the community out here. The community wanted UC San Diego, and the community has gone way out of its way, significantly out of its way, to support us and make us who we are. And you're gonna hear from our community members, our donors, our philanthropists out here. And I think, I would not be exaggerating in saying they are the role models for philanthropy just about anywhere in the country. We are part of the UC system, and we have about half of our students are Pell Grant recipients. So it's not a surprise that when Washington Monthly looks at us and ranks based on our research, which is a billion dollar portfolio, puts us at number five in the country, so they look at our research, they look at our public service, and they look at our social mobility, it is not surprising that they have ranked us number one in the country for the last five years. Ranked higher than most, not most, every private university in the country. Ranked higher than just about everybody with all the endowment they have. And we have been able to take our resources uh, partly from the state, but mainly from philanthropy, and invest it in ways that is making a real difference for this city. And I think it won't be an exaggeration if I were to tell you, and people will tell you, that San Diego would not be what it is without UC San Diego. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Okay, so there are several things we are proud of, but we, one of the things that I personally am most proud of is that we were founded as an experimental campus. And that has given us unfettered license to experiment with anything and everything all the time. And I can tell you, our faculty, our administration, our donors are not afraid of us failing. They want us to experiment. They're pushing us always along the edges. And you will see in a few remarks that I'll make that we are still experimenting. Over the last 54 years, we've created 600 plus companies. We have about a $10 billion impact on San Diego. And I think uh, that we have reshaped and we are feeling this economy would not be an exaggeration, but we are not the only one. Uh, government is a big part of it. Qualcomm is another big part of it. Two of the co-founders, let me just recognize them a little bit, Andy Viterbi and uh, Irwin Jacobs are sitting right here. And I think without them, this city would not be what it is. So while it's good for me to take credit as UC San Diego, uh, I think there are other players who have really made a big impact out here. Uh, and we are pioneering collaboration, and I'll tell you a little bit about this. Uh, so if you look at this mesa, we call this little plateau out here the mesa. There are amazing powerhouses out here. So there's the Salk Institute, Sanford Burnham, La Jolla Allergy, uh, Venter Institute, Scripps Institute, Institute of Oceanography, which by the way is part of UC San Diego. Uh, uh, and, which I have to remind people every time, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's my job, otherwise I don't get paid. Um, and we have used this powerful asset base as a MESA to be extremely collaborative. For example, we have the Sanford Stem Cell Consortium, uh, the only one of its kind in the country that is running stem cell trials as we speak right now. It is a collaboration of all of these institutions coming together, uh, building an infrastructure, sharing scientists, sharing IP, sharing research. We have cross IP arrangements. We have a model of what this country needs to be doing in other cities to really push economic development, push technology development, and really build smart cities, collaborative cities. That is just one of the examples uh, that I can talk about. There are many, many other examples. I, I should also say that faculty from all of these other institutions also have appointments at UC San Diego, and that allows them access to graduate students because not everybody's a degree-granting institution. And the most important property is there is hardly a donor that is not a donor to just about everybody on this chart out here. So there is no notion of a single institution or a donor being committed to a single
single institution. So that's the power of San Diego. That's the power of this Mesa. And, that's, and UC San Diego, if I might brag so, I think has some convening authority, or at least, at least in my mind it does, and I'm kind of shameless about doing that. So back to where we are. Uh, Number three in members of National Academy, uh, the second most research output, univer uh, output university, Nobel Prizes, members of National Medal of Technology and National Medals of Science. So overall a powerhouse. So when I got here a couple of years ago, three years ago, we looked at ourselves and said, you know, 54 years ago, we started as an experiment. We kind of somehow became a great institution. Uh, but 54 years from now, what are, what are we going to look like? So we started creating a strategic plan. And these were the four areas we identified. So the whole idea behind these areas was, number one, uh, a common person should be able to look at this and say, you know what, I know what you do for a living. Number two, 2,000 plus faculty members should be able to look at this. 3,000 plus PhD students, uh, 3,000 plus doctors, and say, you know what? I know how to make a difference in one of these areas. Uh, these are not the only areas we're going to work in. Uh, and last but not the least, we have to be able to show that this is going to make an impact. So let's just look at the four areas. So the first one is understanding and protecting the planet. So obviously, you would think it's about climate research. It's about a whole bunch of issues associ associated with climate. That's not the only thing. It's about pandemics. It's about Ebola. It's about uh, how do we avoid humanity from being wiped away uh, from pandemics. It's about uh, sea level rise. It's about health and uh, oceans. So it's about a whole lot. It's about the asteroid belt. It's about a whole lot of things that clearly could wipe out humanity, could wipe out our planet. Uh, and every one of these issues is spread across the whole campus, uh, across multiple departments in the campus. The second one, which is really uh, significant and important, it's about exploring the basis of human uh, knowledge, learning, and creativity. In other words, it's about understanding the brain and addressing not only the basis of cognition and creativity, but addressing neuro disorders and neuro disease. As much as cancer is a death sentence, I think just about every one of us has had experience with somebody in the family who's got depression, schizophrenia, dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. And this is an uncharted territory. And we at UC San Diego, in collaboration with our partners on this Mesa, Salk Institute, uh, Sanford Burnham, uh, TSRI, I think are poised to build an institute just like the Sanford Stem Cell Consortium, a powerhouse of an institute for neuro disorders and neuro disease. And going forward, that's going to be one of our goals. And I lay this out there because I know many of you in this uh, audience have an interest in this. And we are coming with the number one neuroscience department, neurobiology, Alzheimer's, uh, psychiatry. I think we have everything that it takes to vertically connect, which is goal number three, from basic science and biology, through big data and engineering, into therapies to go from bench side to bedside in two years. And we're going to be accomplishing this goal, and we want to use some exemplars to show how we're going to do this. And last but not the least, my favorite topic is understanding cultures and addressing disparities. If, would, it, would it shock you if I were to tell you half the country with a median, median income of $50,000 cannot afford to send their kids even to a private school? That is a disaster on the verge of happening. It is happening as we sit out here. So when Alex talks about scholarships, I think we need more and more scholarships. We need more and more education. We need more and more educated people. And we, and we need access for, to higher education in ways that we have not imagined before. We need to get back to post-World War II uh, with the GI Bill. We need to have something like that so that the next generation is not going to be uh, uh, a divergent generation, but it's going to be a convergent generation just like this generation was. So with that said, so that's who we are. I am really excited that you're here. And you will see in the next uh, half a day or a full day, a lot of these topics that I'm talking about would be addressed, uh, based starting from algae to biofuels, mapping the brain, uh, personalized medicine through multiomics. We coined the phrase multiomics, or the word multiomics, by the way. Uh, connecting human to uh, human beings, uh, 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 climate to health, and a whole lot of very complicated issues uh, that I think this is one of the few places, not the only place, one of the few places that is able to uh, address. Uh, so I want to stop there and introduce two great colleagues of mine who are going to follow me and who are going to add significant more content to what I just told you about. So 
First is Dr. David Brenner, who is the Vice Chancellor for Health Sciences. Uh, and the second one is uh, Dr. Margaret Leinen, who is the Vice Chancellor for Marine Sciences. So let me start with David. David is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. He heads uh, our School of Medicine, a SCAC School of Pharmacy, and in general, our health system. And he oversees more than 1,000 physicians, uh, scientists, 900 medical uh, graduates, and postdoctoral fellows. Uh, but most importantly, in the 10 years that he's been here, he has positioned our health system to be the number five, to be number five on the NIH funding list. This is not a small feat to accomplish because the other people who were, who were somebody else was number five before was not sleeping while we were trying to climb up the ladder. And David's goal is by the next two quarters to put us at number four. No, not quite. He will. He's 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 getting there. He's getting there. Our second person, uh, Vice Chancellor of Marine Sciences, is Margaret Leinen who leads a group of amazingly dynamic and innovative researchers and students who explore the planet. In fact, as we speak, we have four ships that go out into the ocean, uh, exploring the oceans, understanding the sea waves, understanding a whole bunch of properties of the ocean and the climate. Uh, and these explorers are men and women who dive into the ocean to study marine life. We have one of the largest collections of uh, marine biological samples. And using that, we're going to do, uh, we're doing, uh, discovering drugs from the sea. And all of these complex issues are led by Dr. Mar Dr. Margaret Leinen. So let me start with David first, and then she, he'll be followed by Margaret. David, please. Thank you. So let me extend my welcome to all of you. It's such a pleasure to have you all visiting us. I see you're also going to um, the Cleveland, the Rochester, Minnesota. So um, good, good luck to that. <laughs> you won't have the same picture that um, Chancellor Kostler showed you um, about the ocean for, for those visits. So, so my job in, in 10 minutes is to, um, you can tell from my accent, I'm not, I'm not from California, from New York, so I, I like to make fun of people from the Midwest. <laughs> Um, and I miss New York a little bit. So, so um, uh, what I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about uh, big data and biomedical research, because we are undergoing a revolution in, in, um, in healthcare and in and research in healthcare. Um, unprecedented. This is the biggest change, change ever. Um, and one of the concepts that emerged is that, like all academic medical centers, we're interested in three missions in taking um, care of patients providing care so no one ever has to leave San Diego for their health care, in um, conducting um, research on biomedical research, and in training the next generation of health care providers. And for the first time, those three silos are united by this idea of translational medicine, that you can take research and very efficiently translate it into clinical care and into education. This change has occurred within my career. Uh, when I first became a physician, um, all of the medical records were paper charts. We would pull all the charts from a chart room and analyze them. The, the limit of analysis was a light microscope. The only imaging when I trained was x-rays. And the biomedical research was all conducted by individual labs where a faculty member with a student and a postdoc would do the experiments. This has completely changed. Um, we are now paperless. We, we only use electronic health records. We have advanced molecular imaging, and the figure on the, on the right is a green fluorescent protein visualization of a, um, of a cell, which, as many of you know, was developed by Nobel laureate UCSD faculty member Roger Chen. And the imaging now is functional, from functional MRI to PET-CT to other advanced imaging, and virtually no um, radiographs are used. But maybe the biggest change is in biomedical research from individual laboratories to now multidisciplinary teams that can generate enormous data sets and require informatics to analyze this. So this has changed um, patient care, it's changed research, and it's changed education. Okay. The generation of big data is not the issue. Everyone can generate big data. Everyone can, t can send something to be sequenced and generate enormous data sets or do an image and have enormous data sets. The hard part is to analyze it. The, the analysis, the, the, the joke is it's a $1,000 genome and a $1 million dollar analysis. 
That's the part that, that's hardest, and that's the part I think we at UC San Diego are uniquely um, situated to solve. That um, this, as um, Pradeep told you, is a unique institution with incredible strengths that span everything from very basic science to humanities to patient care. Um, I think um, if you look at UC San Diego, we are probably the only university that has a large medical school with um, a supercomputer capable of handling large data sets, with um, the Qualcomm Institute, which is a cyber infrastructure directed by Larry Smarr, who'll tell you more about the unique um, abilities to analyze big biomedical data and visualize it, with the Jacobs School of Engineering, and a, a, a new program that we developed called the Institute of Engineering and Medicine, where an engineer is paired with a physician so that the physician articulates the clinical problem and then brings engineering principles to that problem to try to solve them. This, this is unique. Most of the places I've ever been in my career are incapable of breaking down these silos and having engineering working closely with medicine. And also, as you hear in a moment, um, the greatest um, oceanographic institution in the world. And it's unique opportunity, as you'll hear in a moment, to do drug discovery from the sea and to um, face issues of um, uh, the environment and, and healthcare. And all this is in the background of the other research institutes on the Torrey Pines Mesa, as Pradeep mentioned to you, and all the biotech companies, um, including most recently one of our alumni, Craig Venter, opened the largest um, whole genome um, sequencing facility in the world. So we are in a unique situation to be able to generate large data and, and then to analyze it. Okay. The, the concept that's evolved in medicine for this switch from um, looking at patients as large groups, looking at individual patients, is called precision medicine. And what happens is that um, we are capable of generating these large data sets shown on the, on the left, genomics, the other multiomics, as, as um, Pradeep coined, stem cells to represent each individual patient, nanotechnology, molecular imaging, and then combine that with the um, data from individual patients, electronic health record, environmental data, this advanced molecular imaging and biomarkers. This integration of these large data sets are going to lead to better diagnosis, customized therapy, and individual um, patient care. So this is one example um, from, um, um, generated by um, someone who, who's going to talk to you um, shortly, um, Dr. Kuzrak, where um, an individual patient who had a very um, um, bad diagnosis, a drug-resistant lung cancer, was able to go through a series of steps that are unique to, to, to today's healthcare. We've not been available a year ago in which um, a liquid biopsy was done, in which um, cells from the cancer were picked up in the blood, were used to diagnose a driver mutation, which means mutation that is causing this cancer to grow, was treated specifically from a local biotech company with a drug that was, that was devoted to blocking that specific mutation and, ha and had a remission. That, 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 that sequence this industrial academic interaction, this um, um, precision medicine was completely unheard of as, as little as a year ago. So let me just introduce the people who we're going to talk to you now um, about um, um, big data and, um, and, and patient care. And each one of them is the, is the world's leader in, in their field. And each one of them shares our vision. Um, of this university to do something amazing for society. Rizal Kuzrak, who I just mentioned, came from MD Anderson. She is the world's leader in precision medicine. She runs the largest first-in-patient first clinical trial um, facility um, in the world for individual patient care. Um, Lucilla Onomachada came from Harvard. She's one of the very few people who are trained as both computer science and um, and, and a physician, and she has set up the way we can interrogate the electronic health record to improve quality of care. Kelly Frazier is a human um, geneticist who has brought together many people throughout Torrey Pines Mesa to be the center for um, genetic studies. And, um, and Rob Knight just joined us from University of Colorado. He is the key thought leader on the role of the microbiome, in other words, the um, bacteria and viruses in your, um, 
digestive system, in your skin, other places that he'll tell you about that, um, that, that interact with um, um, your own genome and understands how your gut microbiome and, uh, and, other, and, other, mic and other bacteria um, are responsible for both health and disease. And I will stop there and thank you for your attention. Good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the Scripps Forum. Uh, we're delighted to have you here today. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, a very, uh, just a couple minutes about Scripps Oceanography and then tell you why a group like you would be hearing from faculty in oceanography. So we are uh, the oldest oceanogra academic oceanographic institution in the country one of the oldest in the world, uh, and certainly the largest academic uh, oceanographic enterprise. And much of what we do is what you would expect when you think of oceanography. This slide at the, or the image at the top uh, shows our four research vessels at a unique time when all four were actually in port. We like to have them out at sea. Uh, and uh, in, in uh, their oceanographic research, they span the entire spectrum of work, uh, the physical circulation of the ocean, its interaction with the atmosphere, its chemistry, its biology. And much of the work that we do is uh, what you would expect at an oceanographic institution. But much of it uh, goes far beyond the, the boundary of the ocean itself. Uh, for example, in the upper left, uh, our researchers are very actively involved in polar research. Uh, just last month, articles in Science and Nature focused on our work in demonstrating the thinning of the Antarctic ice shelves. And on the, at the other pole, the resilience of the sea ice in the Arctic and whether it's able to come back uh, from the warming that, and, uh, and uh, melting that's going on now. In the upper right, uh, our, our workers and our researchers in atmospheric chemistry are actively involved with partners in India and China, looking at the ways that we can transfer information about uh, air pollution and air quality uh, to those nations, uh, to have them go through the same revolution that we have here, going from the LA of 50 years ago to the LA of today in terms of air quality, uh, looking at the sources, unpacking how much contribution comes from uh, res private uh, uh, vehicles, uh, uh, commercial transportation, uh, uh, factories, et cetera. On the lower right is the uh, concentration, the curve showing the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere since 1957. Uh, this iconic curve started, uh, the research started by Charles David Keeling here at Scripps Oceanography, has become the primary indicator of what we're doing to our atmosphere as a result of our burning of fossil fuels and has really become the image for climate change. Uh, on the lower left, our researchers in solid earth uh, science uh, look at everything from uh, seismology, gravity, geodesy, uh, paleomagnetics, the, the real uh, heartbeat of the Earth itself. So it's this broad uh, capability, not only in oceanography, but in Earth and space science, uh, that has given Scripps the reputation that it has in those areas. And so as we have thought about that and developed over the last few years, we've really uh, looked at the opportunity that that breadth and depth gives us to look at the issue of human health and the oceans. And it's one of the areas in which we have a major initiative uh, that goes far beyond looking at uh, some of the typical things that you see if you, if you Google oceans and human health, what you'll find is pictures of uh, red tide algae blooms in the coast, like the one that's shown here, which was right off San Diego, and something about seafood safety, uh, concentrations of heavy metals in our seafood or persistent organics. But 
our relationship between the oceans and our human health is much deeper than that. There is a reason that our bodily fluids are salty. We came from the ocean. And it's conferred on us a long history uh, in our embryonic development, in our microbiome, in the way that our bodies work and, that, and interact with uh, the environment that is a powerful tool for understanding ourselves. It also is a treasure trove of unique molecules, unique living strategies uh, from which we can develop marine natural products and from which we can learn about ourselves. So you're going to hear today, this afternoon, uh, from four of our researchers that will give you a flavor for human health and the oceans. The first of those is Professor Bradley Moore, who is the uh, head of our Scripps Center on Oceans and Human Health, funded by National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Environmental Health Science. They're looking at uh, halogenated organic compounds. Naturally occurring halogenated compounds in the ocean, are many are very similar to some of the most toxic substances that we have synthesized, flame retardants, um, um, uh, defoliants, and they're being made naturally in the ocean. So who's making them? Why are they making them? How are they making them? And for what purpose? How are they deployed? This rich mix of being able to look at natural chemical factories for, uh, t for compounds like this and then be able to unravel uh, their biosynthetic pathways, the genomics, and the interactions uh, is, is a terrific uh, new area of research for us. Uh, Professor William Gerwick will talk about the Center for Marine Biotechnology and Bioengineering, uh, or Biomedicine. Uh, this is the group that has really pioneered the field of developing marine natural products from the ocean, including uh, many interesting drugs that are already being used and in clinical trials. Uh, one of the potential first new antibiotics in 25 years that's effective against MRSA. Uh, compounds that uh, that are effective against some of the pathways in Alzheimer's, a really uh, interesting area that capitalizes on the biodiversity and the biocomplexity of the ocean. <laughs> Professor Paul Jensen is going to uh, talk about the relationship between this work and big data. Uh, David talked to you about the tremendous strength here at UCSD and with our partners in being able to not just collect big data, but to use it and analyze it. And uh, Professor Jensen is going to talk about some of the techniques uh, that we're using and some of the discoveries that are coming out of our ability to really understand the use of big data. Uh, and finally, uh, Professor Kim Prather is going to take you in a very different direction. She's the director of the Center for Aerosol Impacts on Climate and the Environment. And this, uh, this uh, center looks at what happens when you have a very active sea surface like that, uh, um, and which is putting, every time the waves are breaking, puts bubbles into the atmosphere that hold a distillation of the surface organic layer of the ocean and are full of microbes and viruses. So when you, as uh, Pradeep said, smell the ocean when you go outside, breathe deep, and think about all the, the viruses that you're inhaling <laughs> and all the microbes that you're inhaling. But the serious question is, this has been going on for our whole lifetimes. Is this a special benefit to us? Are we, uh, is this conferring uh, a kind of um, uh, degree of, uh, of immunity to us in the same way that uh, our, uh, the uh, sort of dirty life that I had as a child uh, protected me from a lot of, of uh, different kinds of uh, um, infections? Or is it something that we need to worry about? And what are the relationships between these aerosol particles and uh, some of the other processes that are going on and that affect us through, through climate? Um, what you won't hear, but um, is another aspect of what we do, is using the organisms in the ocean 
itself to understand ourselves. So we have very active work in, in sea urchins and other organisms as model organisms, uh, understanding the way that development takes place in their, uh, uh, in their embryos and its relationship to us. This unique character there in the lower right is a methane ice worm. It's an, uh, a worm that spends its whole life living frozen into methane ice at the bottom of the ocean. It has a very simple environment, but it has a very complex microbiome, uh, both gut and skin. And by exploiting the fact that it lives in such a small, uh, such a simple environment, we're able to give tools uh, to researchers like Dr. Knight to help us understand what, it, what the relationship is just between the microbiome and the skin not including all of those other impacts that, that you and I see all, all the time. So it's a rich area of, uh, of research and one that we are uh, beginning a very exciting new um, initiative on. And it's really possible here and, mo and exciting here because of this in, in, uh, ecology of health that is around us. So our initiative benefits from uh, joint faculty positions that we have with the School of Medicine, the School of Pharmacy, the other science and engineering departments on the main campus of the university, uh, with um, the Venter Institute, uh, active funded collaborations with our, our partners uh, the Salk Institute, TSRI, um, the uh, several of the pharma companies that have labs here on the Mesa, and two new um, um, initiatives within uh, UCSD, uh, the one on the microbiome, precision medicine, and another one on health and climate change are also going, we're beginning searches for joint faculty members uh, to interact with those as well. So this constellation of capabilities gives us a, a unique and exciting uh, ability to look at that fundamental relationship that we have with 70% of the rest of the globe. Where we came from, how it's influenced us, how it's influencing us today, what we can learn from it, and what we can get from it in terms of resources. So I look forward to talking with you all today. Thanks very much, and I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, David. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, next, I want you to hear from uh, a great friend of the university. So when one thinks about a scholar, when one thinks about a gentleman, an innovator, an entrepreneur, all rolled into one, one thinks about Irwin Jacobs. Uh, Irwin and his wife, Joan Jacobs, have really transformed philanthropy in San Diego. Uh, as you know, Irwin is one of the co-founders of Qualcomm, which by itself has transformed San Diego. Uh, but Irwin has been a longtime uh, friend of the university, a longtime friend of San Diego. I think there's hardly uh, cause in San Diego that has not been touched by Joan and Irwin Jacobs. And they are the role models, uh, they are the transformers, and I'm so proud and glad to have known them. In fact, Irwin was on the search committee that picked me. That might be the only mistake he made in his life. <laughs> but having said that, I want to see you from Irwin Jacobs. Irwin. As many of you can tell, from hearing Pradeep, uh, we're very pleased that not only that we chose him, but that he accepted, and we've been having fun watching the progress of the university under his leadership. So we look forward to many more years of that success. I was asked to say a little bit about uh, the pleasures, perhaps, of philanthropy with respect to UCSD. And uh, I probably should just say a few words about why we have been involved with UCSD as friends. Uh, I originally came to San Diego to teach at UCSD, and that was back in 1966, six years after the founding, the official founding, and still when it was a very, very small school. And um, it was just a very exciting place to be at that time. Uh, Scripps Institute of Oceanography, I remember going down, neuroscience was taught there initially, and so sitting in on some doctoral student exams, et cetera, uh, committees in uh, scripts. 
um, offer a course in computing and who would show up as well as engineering students, but also some from the music department, some from the art department. And so it was kind of fun being able to be there at the beginning and just see how the school started and then over the years watching it develop. Um, started a company called Linkovit uh, initially and then began to grow. And uh, so I dropped out in 1972. <laughs> uh, but having dropped out, I've stayed very, very close and uh, just very much have enjoyed watching this development. Obviously, our initial interests have been in engineering and uh, a lot of the benefits to Linkabit, then Qualcomm, then many other industries have come from engineering. And of course, now that discipline is spreading everywhere, so having a significant impact on health around the, the city. But uh, we were, um, uh, first of all, uh, in a position early on to actually give the first chair, named chair, uh, to the university until, and that was about 1980, 81. Uh, until then, being a public university, uh, UCSD really didn't go out to raise funding because it was supposed, not supposed to compete with the private universities. But as state funding went down, then that became more and more of a necessity. And so being able to help faculty positions was important. Next area we began to concentrate on was uh, scholarships and fellowships uh, for students. Uh, students have the faculty. Students are obviously the key items in a university, key people in a university, and important to be able to attract very good students or students who might not be able to afford to come uh, otherwise. And so we've had the great benefits of uh, being able to meet with these students each year since we live locally and, in fact, take them to a cultural activity uh, uh, each year. So that's helped maintain that very close contact with the university. Uh, talking about cultural activities, uh, I think clearly a university is very important to have significant culture. And so we uh, have been involved with a few different issues at the uh, at UCSD on that. The La Jolla Playhouse uh, has become very well known for having excellent plays that have gone on to Broadway, including recently one flop, Dr. Zhivago, <laughs> only lasted a few days. Uh, although we, we did go back for the opening and enjoyed it. But some like Jersey Boys and yes. Memphis, et cetera, uh, and, and several others have indeed done very well. And so it's been exciting to watch that. We also have been involved with this, something called the Stewart Collection. And for those that are uh, visiting, um, one that I particularly like is a art piece involved in the School of Engineering. It's a house that's tipped, about to fall off one of the strong, high concrete towers. And so um, if you uh, get a chance, I, it just brings a smile to one's face to see it. But I think also it's important for engineers to have this kind of whimsical input as well. I think that does help make better, uh, better engineers. Um, we more recently have been very much involved with the medical school, uh, initially with uh, Redner research uh, due to a problem that my wife uh, had, and that has moved ahead. And now uh, we've had the opportunity to help with a new uh, medical Health Center, a, a 10-story tower that will house uh, three different pavilions of medicine and um, I think should, among other things, of course, help promote very good health here, but I think also be a very good conduit for the research that's coming out of this uh, area of the Mesa and uh, be able to bring that to clinical use very much more, much more effectively. And so, uh, We've enjoyed watching that development from actually seeing the initial uh, groundbreaking for the medical school way back under the original Governor Brown and, of course, to what has uh, happened uh, ever since. So that's been very special. And finally, we've been also very lucky to help on the research side, in particular uh, Cal IT2, uh, or it's been mentioned here, the Qualcomm Institute is the local part of Cal IT2. Our, a research facility that, um, uh, in a sense, was suggested to the state, Governor uh, Gray Davis, uh, to help replace the fact that 
major research institutions such as Bell Laboratories were uh, going away, uh, not getting the support they had in the past, and that the state could support these types of institutions. And in fact, we made the decision to provide a, uh, a major donation, we being Qualcomm, uh, donation uh, to CalIT2 uh, during a, I was up in San Jose uh, with Pre uh, President Clinton talking about the digital divide and uh, one might be able to uh, overcome that with variety of research and different activities and we announced that we were going to support this new research institute and you'll hear more about that but it's just been wonderful fun to watch how that indeed has moved ahead. And so over the years, uh, we've had this great opportunity to be able to provide support to UCSD. UCSD has transformed this whole community, has had significant transformational impact on the country and the world, and I think that uh, that clearly is going to continue. The great thing is being able to make, provide some philanthropy, and then just see these amazing results go forth, how much the few dollars leveraging that and producing great results. So, been wonderful working and we look forward to many great new things. And again, very happy that you are here, Pradeep. <laughs>